Hey, we'd like to welcome Miss Mary O'Leary, better known as Reparata, from Reparata and the Delrons. And did I pronounce it right? Yes, you did. Mary, welcome to the show, and I'm going to call you Mary rather than Reparata because Mary's a whole lot easier to pronounce. Okay, that's fine, Donnie. Okay, uh, take us back in time. How did you, first of all, how did you come up with the name Reparata? Well, I took the name as a confirmation name back in seventh grade at Good Shepherd Elementary School. She was a nun, Sister Mary Reparata. And in the, in the Catholic religion, when you, when you get confirmed, you take a name. And I took her name. And when the group was first beginning, we were the Delrons. And our manager said, you know, we need something catchy to go in front of that. And they asked all of our middle names. And as luck would have it, my name was uh, Reparata. And they said, that's it, Reparata. And it's Latin for to make atonement, to repair things. Well, uh, the Delrons got started, what, and then 62? I was around 62, 61, 62. We were in high school. That would be uh, 61. We were sophomores in high school. And how did you happen to get with Lori Records? Well, that was Steve Jerome. Steve was our manager and producer for our whole career, basically. And uh, he had connections at Lori. And when we did the for our first tune, which, which was Your Big Mistake, he shopped it around, and Lori was interested, and that was the beginning of the Lori label. And then uh, you went on to World Artist Label, I believe. Right. That was where we had Whenever a Teenager Cries and Tommy. And they were headquartered in Pittsburgh, as a matter of fact. Right. Now, and I've been racking my brain to try to think of the hotel we used to stay in, and I couldn't think of it. But we were in Pittsburgh a lot in the beginning because, uh, obviously, that's where World Artist was headquartered. It may have been the William Penn. No, that doesn't ring a bell. Okay, well, we'll do some figuring out and <laughs> come up with something for you. But uh, tell, how did you happen to meet uh, Ernie Maresca, uh, who wrote well, uh, the song? Yeah, Ernie wrote Your Big Mistake, right? Well, I know he wrote Whenever a Teenager Cries. At least that's oh, what my right. research says. Yes, yes. Well, Ernie used to come up to the studio. Steve had a studio on... Uh, well, in, in the beginning, he was on Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn. And Ernie would come in and, you know, play songs that he'd written. And uh, when we heard Whenever a Teenager Cries, you know, everyone thought that was the song. So, But he would come up to the studio often to play piano, you know, to chat, talk about the business, and play his latest, uh, his latest songs. And um, Teenager happened to be one of them. Well, I know that he had recorded for Lori and uh, did a lot of work with uh, Dion. I had a chance to talk with Ernie before his untimely passing a couple years ago. But yeah, that was awful. No, uh, I tell you, I hate going on Facebook because that's what you see. You know, who's passed away, and it's it's very disconcerting to see, you know, people that we worked with and people that, you know, we had contact with back then. And we're all getting on in years, unfortunately, so. Okay, you basically have made a career out of uh, Whenever a Teenager Cries. That was your biggest. I know you've had a couple other hits uh, over in England, but mm -hmm. how does somebody who has basically a top uh, 100 song uh, open up for the Rolling Stones in 65? Oh, yeah, you did your homework. We tried. Um, you know, whenever a teenager cries was, uh, you know, it was to me a blip on the radar of rock and roll. But it did open doors for us, and we did, we did some wonderful shows with a lot of wonderful people on the strength of whenever a teenager cries. And um, it was just luck. I mean, we did it. I think it was Convention Hall in Philadelphia. We were on the bill with uh, the Rolling Stones. And needless to say, it was very, very exciting. You know, we were kids. We were 19, 20 years old. 
and to us, we were more thrilled just to see the Rolling Stones and to, you know, to be on the bill. It was a very exciting time, something that, you know, not too many people are blessed with. So even though it wasn't a great hit, it, 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 it opened the door to a lot of wonderful experiences for us. Uh, it seems like you, like I said, you made a career out of it. I don't know whether you're still doing a lot of singing or not, or whether you're doing any touring at all, but uh, we get requests for whenever teenager cries, and uh, only number 60 on the uh, billboard list, but it made you a career for you. Well, I'll tell you, it was very big here in New York, because at the time we were high school students, and, you know, all our, they would have a contest every, I forget, on WMCA or WABC, uh, you know, the local radio stations. And w whenever Teenager Cries would come in first, followed by the Beatles, you know, one of the Beatles songs. So everyone would call in, all of our friends from high school would call in and vote for us. So it was a big, uh, much bigger hit here in New York. It was top ten for, oh, months. But uh, nationally, it didn't do as well, as you said. Okay, tell us about uh, Captain of Your Ship. That was a big hit over in England rather than over here in the U.S. Is that yes. correct? Yes, that's right. I believe that was 1967-68. We recorded the tune, and it didn't do anything here in the U.S. And we thought, well, that's a dead issue. Then our manager came in and said, you're not going to believe this. It's climbing the charts in the UK and I believe that was in March of 68 and before you knew it we were on our way to London and we you know we toured through England extensively in Scotland and Wales we went over to Germany and uh, it that too was a wonderful experience and that was a bigger hit than teenager here I believe it was top ten in uh, in London. I believe it went to number thirteen in the UK. At least uh, that's what my research is telling me. Okay, you but, got it, Arnie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how did you find the audiences over in Europe as compared to the U.S.? Were they more appreciative of the uh, American stars, or were they just enamored to see four beautiful teenage girls? Well, I, I think the audiences were about the same um, in terms of enthusiasm. Um, the English audience, I think, might have been a little more reserved. Uh, and that's the way I recall. And I have to warn you, I don't have a great memory. But, um, I, uh, you know, as I recall, they were a bit more reserved. Okay. Uh, I hate to get controversial, but I'm going to. This will be the most controversial question I ask. Can uh, you comment about the lawsuit with Lorraine over the name Reparata? I will comment. Let me, let me get my facts straight. Uh, Lorraine went and auditioned with Barry Manilow and purported to be Reparata. Um... He hired her. She was one of Lady Flash. She was a background singer. And um, people would call me and say, like she was on David Letterman. And it was 11.30. I was dead asleep. And the, my phone rang, and it was Lou Christie. He said, Mary, you're not going to believe it. There's someone on David Letterman who says she's you. I thought, oh, my God. So I, have, I flipped on the TV, but I missed her segment. And Ron Dante was another one, because I knew Ron Dante from when he was in the detergents. We did the Dick Clark tour together. And um, he also commented. You know, a lot of people commented. She decided to purport that she was reparata. And, a lawsuit, and then I had a record come out. It was called Shoes. And it charted right away in New York. I mean, in, on Billboard. It came on Billboard at 90. And it was, a, it was charting really big in Europe. And she and her lawyer called Polydor. It was Polydor Records, I think. And said, Reparata does not have a... Oh, no, they didn't call... They called Billboard. 
because they reviewed the record. They called Billboard. They called Polydor. They called Cashbox to say that Reparata does not have a, a record out now. She is currently with Barry Manilow. And they squashed the record. You know, nobody wants to be in the middle of a litigation. So the record went down the tubes. We went to court over the rights of the name. And it had nothing to do with money, Arnie. It has to do with the principle of the thing. Right. I mean, you know, that's been my name since seventh grade. And she was not even in the group until, oh, maybe it was the, the 70s, the mid-70s. So, you know, she had no right to, to be me. That's what it came down to. So that was the story of the, uh, the name. Did you win your case or... Well, she disappeared from the face of the earth. She was no longer contactable. She just disappeared. And that was the end of the suit. And I continued to use the name. Now, that's good because I know that there's been a couple of bills in Congress about uh, unfair practices where people will go out and say that they're members of a group when they have nothing to do with the group. And there's been a lot of court cases over that recently, it seems like. Well, it's, it's rampant, you know, as you well know. You know, there are uh, many groups purport to be the Drifters or the Crystals or the Marvelettes or whomever, and there really is not an original member in the group. So, yeah, you uh, it's copy. You know, it's all about copywriting. Back in the day, uh, you know, we didn't know anything about copywriting or production or management. We were just thrilled to be able to get on stage and do a show. You know, we were young and dumb, and we would completely remove from the business end of things. So, you know, it, 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 things would be different now in a lot of ways. When, once you get a little bit older, uh, you get a little bit more knowledge on these things, and you know mm -hmm. who to trust and who not to trust. But yeah. when you're just well, you starting out... Well, you can't put an old head on young shoulders, and that's the way it was. We would just we would have sung for nothing on the corner, you know, if you could give us an audience. So, and that's the way it was, I think, for a lot of groups. Okay, before we go any farther, I think that you have a shout out that you want to take care of. I certainly do, Andrew. I hope you're listening. I, I can't, you know, this is for Andrew and for you, Arnie. I never even knew such a thing existed as a reparata in the Delron's Facebook page. When I went on that page and saw all of the information, and factually correct, and the pictures, he has found pictures that I have never even seen in my life. It's, and he does such a fabulous job, and he's so eloquent, and I, I just, I'm in love with him. I think he's such a wonderful, wonderful guy, and I thank him from the bottom of my heart, because you know, fans, wonderful. The fans that go on and see it. But to me, it's absolutely gratifying and edifying to see all of this information and done in such a professional, wonderful way. Thank you, Andrew, forever. Well, would you like to mention that Facebook page? Yes, it's Reparata and the Delrons on Facebook. And if you go on the page, you'll learn more than I know about the group. Because Andrew is a, an expert researcher, obviously. Okay, we got that shout-out taken care of. Take us back in time. Tell us about the uh, root of rock and roll against famine. Oh, that now, for the love of rock and roll, deep down in your soul. Yes, we all went into the studio. It's coming back to me, Arnie. <laughs> we all went into the studio and recorded. It was on the heels of um, We Are the World, I guess. Okay. And a lot of stuff. This is another interesting story. We all went into the studio and recorded this tune. It was really a beautiful tune. I think uh, Joey D kind of uh, spearheaded the, um, the song. And uh, it was put out, and supposedly the proceeds were supposed to go to fight famine in the world. Now, again, I say the business end of things I'm not much up on, but... 
I was in the studio, and I did... Oh, I, of course, I had a little blurb in the song to do on my own. And right after I finished singing it, Paul Schaefer came out of the control room. He said, I'm so happy to finally meet the real reparata. Because he had been uh, David Letterman's musical director when Lorraine was on. So that was exciting for me, you know, to be acknowledged. Well, that's good. Let me ask you one other question real quick. Do you have a couple minutes that you still have with me? Because we need to take commercial break right now. Sure. I, Go right ahead. And I want to keep you on. Now, we're back. Uh, Mary O'Leary, Reparata from Reparata and the Delrons with us. And you made a career after uh, music, didn't you, uh, Mary? Tell yes, us about the, your teaching career. My mother and father were very, very supportive of the singing. They never uh, thwarted my efforts. They were very supportive. But they insisted that I go back to college and get my degree. And I did, and I taught for 32 years. And, you know, in addition to the singing all along. But, um, you know, needless to say, singing is not going to give you health insurance and a pension. So thank God I did, and I, I, I loved teaching. I retired oh, about... I guess around 12 years ago, and I miss it to this day because I really loved teaching. I taught, uh, I was a classroom teacher most of the time, grades three through six. And Arlene Smith, too, is a retired teacher, I believe. Yeah, I read in Arlene every so often. Uh huh. Now, do your kids uh, find it interesting that uh, their teacher was a former singer? You know what? I never, ever mentioned it. And no one ever... The only time... Once in a... a I, I taught for 25 years in bed -Stuy. Never said a word about my teaching. Then I transferred to a school here in Brooklyn in Mill Basin. And somehow all of the teachers came to a Westbury show. So, you know, that, that was... It was nice to see so many, you know, supportive colleagues from a different field. But other than that, I really never, never broached the subject with my children. Now, some of your contemporaries, uh, like the Shangri-Las, uh, seemed like they uh, had, were out about the same time. They had the same type of material, but did they get better breaks or better songs? Or why do you think that they made it and you didn't? Okay, I'm going to tell you why, because I know why. I believe that our follow-up songs in each case were uh, misguided. We had Whenever a Teenager Cries and followed it up with Tommy, which was a very different kind of song. There was another song, how, that's how it all began. You know, I believe if you have a hit, you have to stick with that feel, that style of song. You can't go off in a completely different direction and expect to have any uh, uh, staying power. At least your second song has to mirror the first. And it was the same thing with Captain of Your Ship. Captain of Your Ship was, uh, was the hit there in, in uh, London and in a lot, a lot of other countries in Europe. And the follow-up should have been a song called Weather Forecast, which was similar. But instead, we came out with Saturday Night Didn't Happen. And as I said... At the time, we really had very little say as to what was going to be released, what wasn't, how it was produced, what material we even did. We were kind of just pawns in the game of rock and roll. And I believe if our, uh, if our follow-ups had been selected more carefully, I think we might have stuck around a little longer. Well, you put it very well then. Uh, any regrets or anything that you would have changed other than uh, the follow-up songs during your career? You know, I would have... Back, when we started singing again in the, the 80s and the 90s, we really had a good act. I mean, we really were good, not to toot my own horn. But we rehearsed religiously. We had our own band... We kept up with the times in terms of technology and so on with sound equipment and amplification, and we really put on a really good show. Back in the day, 
you weren't given that opportunity. You went into, first of all, we did a lot of hops. Where you'd go in and you would lip sync. And that, uh, to me, was the least gratifying thing you could do, lip sync a record. And then you would go and do clubs and you'd have to use the house band. And they were supposed to learn like an hour of material in a half hour. It just didn't happen. So the shows were not as good as they could have been. And also, you know, pr promoters, if they had gone out of their way a little more to produce the show uh, more elaborately, if you will. Like we worked at the Tropicana for a couple of weeks. Dick Fox pr um, produced a show there. And, it, you know, they had the setting and the band was fabulous and the rehearsals. It was run like a top. And those were good shows. But earlier on, the shows were kind of catch as catch can. And that I regret. Did you ever get a chance to work with Richard Nader at any of his rock and roll yes, novels? Yes, we did uh, the Felt, it was the Felt Forum with um, Richard Nader. I think we only worked from two or three times. And, uh, you know, Dick Fox worked with us a lot. He, we did just about all of his Westbury shows, and as I said, the Tropicana. He was a great source of quality. Still there? Yes. Okay, I thought I lost you for a second. Well, Dick Fox, I believe, is manager of the Golden Boys, Frankie Avalon, Fabian, yes. and Bobby Rydell. Yes, he is. But uh, just on a side note, Richard Nader got his start on right here at WMBS Radio back in the late uh, 50s. So. Oh, did he? I didn't realize that. Yeah, we lost Richard too soon, too, but uh, his wife's trying to keep the tradition going. Yeah, I know, and he had a terrible fire, too. I think his house burned down shortly before he died. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Okay, uh, before I let you go, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and enlightening our listening audience about Reparata and the Delrons. But I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different, if you would. And mm -hmm. that's play disc jockey. And if you would introduce whenever a teenager cries for our audience, I want to play it for our listening audience now. Wonderful, wonderful. So go ahead and if you would introduce it, we'll play it. Okay, here we go with Whenever a Teenager Cries by Reparata and the Delrons. My mama said to me, Do you really love that guy? Does he ever make you cry? Rain falling from the sky
Raparada and the Dalrons, and whenever a teenager cries, you still get a thrill hearing that on the radio? I certainly do. I certainly do. Yep. Uh, I'm just sorry that it didn't get more airplay because it's a good song and a catchy song, but yeah, it is. It's a, it's a you know bubblegummy, but it's it, it it touched our hearts in the studio when we after we finished recording it, we knew that that was the release. That should be the release. So okay, and your follow up was a song called Tommy. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, any stories about Tommy? Um, well, uh, so many people thought it was dedicated to them. You know, every Tommy that I knew said, and actually it really wasn't dedicated to anybody in particular, but every time, you know, every to- friend that I had that was named Tommy thought it was his song. But as I say, we didn't think that should have been the follow-up. Well, I didn't. But it's still near and dear to my heart. Okay, before I have you introduce that, would you like to mention your Facebook page again? Yes, the Facebook page is Reparata and the Delrons. And that is R-E-P-A-R-T-A? A-R-A-T-A. Wait, let's start, spell it again, please. R-E-P-A-R-A-T-A and the Delrons. Okay, that's what... I thought, but I have it written down two different ways. Uh, Mary, I want to thank you again for your time and your patience with me, and we're going to turn you into the disc jockey one more time, and if you would go ahead and introduce Tommy, we're going to play it for our listening audience. Okay, great. Okay, this is Reparata of Reparata and the Delrons, and you're listening to WMBS in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. And here's Tommy. <laughs> 